very much. So uh, much like Martin, I really do want to say thank you uh, very much to the organizers. And, and uh, I too am sad that COVID and travel restrictions mean that we're doing this remotely and we don't have a chance to all get together in, in Beijing, which I you know, think would have been a very nice backdrop for a lot of the personal interactions. And while Zoom has been pretty useful for giving talks and lets us hold conferences and sometimes we get people to come that couldn't normally come, you know, because the, the commitment is a little bit less. It, it still has not, we have not got, I don't think, great ways of interacting on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, and that, that I think is something that's really unfortunate and where Bioconductor as a conference is usually a, you know, a very important uh, part of what's going on. Um, that said, uh, you know, it just wanted to echo a little bit uh, some of what Martin said. You know, we started Bioconductor very collaboratively. There were a group of, of us when I was first at Harvard at the, the Dana-Farber who, you know, got together and talked about how do we sort of make an impact and how do we move into a space like computational biology that's just getting going um, and bring some of the tools that we're used to in statistics and statistical methodology and, and bring that in. And mostly what we uh, ended up on what, what was the idea that if we were able to sort of share data structures and agree on what they might look like, then people could write code for different sort of algorithms that sit on top of them. And that was really a, a focus at the very start. Um, and it, it's pretty interesting to see how much those basic ideas have evolved, how many people have gotten involved and been felt like they had the opportunity to make substantial contributions. Um, but a lot of the data sets that we see now, you know, I would argue the single cell and the summarized experiment, these really do owe a little bit of a legacy back to, to those initial ideas. And I think that, that it's really, you know, quite interesting to see how how well that idea is sort of fleshing out and, and becoming important. One of the, the things that, uh, you know, Bioconductor, I think, has also started to see in, in the last five years or 10 years is, you know, a move away from a package as being, you know, sort of the basic unit. So, it, so a package is the basic unit of a particular computation, but we need to start to think about workflow. So how do we pass through multiple different types of computation with a single data set or sets of data sets, et cetera. Um, and, you know, th those sorts of tools are becoming important in understanding them and being able to, to program in them and make sure that we, we maintain data provenance from the start of computation through to the end. I think is is a challenge that people are are facing and, and doing quite quite nice work on. Um, today's talk, I'm going to sort of say, well, you know, we've done all that and it's been fantastic. We're generating lots and lots of data, but now what's going to happen? And more or less, my view is that you know what the next decade is going to be largely about is really understanding how to put data together in important ways and then use that data to start to make you know sort of other biological uh, decisions design experiments and uh, given my new position at harvard i've become much more interested or focused i guess not so much interested focused on um, how do we take some of this stuff and really put it into clinical practice so in the talk that i'm going to give i'll try to set the stage a little bit and then give some examples of uh, you know just how i think uh, the, the, the evolution is going to happen and how we could start to develop software and tools that will really change um, healthcare. And part of that, uh, I'll spend some time on human genetics, which is pretty much what I did the last five or six years at 23andMe. So I hope there'll be uh, something in, in the talk for everyone um, and uh, that, that it will sort of uh, pique your interest. So, you know, as I said, I'm going to walk through these problems, look at the, the role for software data and algorithms, um, look at you know, one of the key things to really understanding biology or any uh, paradigm, which is perturbations. Um, we need lots of ways to perturb a system and see how it changes in order to be able to, to really understand it. Um, and one, one of my favorite perturbations of systems is, is basically genetic uh, variation. Um, and then, I'll, as I said, I'll walk through some things to think about, like how do we get to clinical solutions? All right, so here's here's my current 
sort of view, data are going to just play this increasingly important role. We generate large amounts of data faster today than we did yesterday, and that will just keep continuing on for quite a long time. Um, computational biology and medicine, these new high throughput assays, whether they're single cell RNA seq, single cell attack seq, um, some of the proteomic uh, methods, methods that combine, um, you know, sort of. Uh, uh, spatial information and transcript, et cetera. I'll give you some pictures and, and talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, these are just really important things for us to be worrying about. And while we collect this data um, and, and generate it, we can put it into databases. We, when we do that and when we're careful about that, so we have you know, nice, well annotated and carefully analyzed databases, I think they will start to give us really deep insight into sort of fundamental biology and, and fundamental uh, impact of, of that biology on human health, which for me at least is one of the, the reasons that I am so interested in it is just how, you know, it's very complicated and you want to find ways to, to find new therapeutics or new uh, uh, opportunities to help cure some of the large amount of unmet medical need that, that exists in the world today. And then I'll talk a little bit about, you know, once you have a good idea and you can show analytically that it seems to be a good idea, it turns out there's an awful lot of work that needs to go on to get from that idea into something that you could actually use in a hospital. And again, this is something that we as a community have a big opportunity to play a role in. It's, it's a, a place that sort of starts to get closer to, to doctors and what they, they do uh, and, and interact, how they interact with people. Um, and it it's sort of is a wide open opportunity right now. All right, so here's a super busy slide, um, but it's really trying to show you know, a broad swath of data that we now can get and think about. So here in the, in the upper left is, a, is just an image from a pathology slide. You can see there are cells. Uh, this is probably uh, you know, a colon or something. There are sort of crypts and, and different cells. They've been stained with a dye that tells me something about them. And you know, sort of what can we do from that? So, these sorts of images, and I'm not going to talk about them today, um, a, there is a huge amount of work going on, uh, a little more in Python than I think in R these days around image analysis and you know, trying to understand what's different between a healthy image and a, and a, and a diseased image. Can we detect disease better with machine learning, et cetera? So there is you know, a wealth of information there, but if I was to take this slide and, and maybe have another one that was cut from the same tissue, sort of really right next door to it, so that when you looked at the two of them, you could see that they were essentially showing me the same thing, then I could sort of run it through different processes. So one of these slides we could take down this bottom road, we would basically dissociate cells from each other, or run them through a standard, you know, so a, a single cell uh, operation, and basically uh, out of that, be able to uh, detect RNA, uh, understand which cells are present, et cetera. If I take the other slide and go through this top one, there's an experimental technology called SciSIF. Um, basically what it's doing is it then from that slide will come in with antibodies that have fluorescent uh, tags on them against particular proteins. And so you introduce a, a set of antibodies, four or five in a, in a single uh, uh, a stain, you basically add the antibodies seen here, you image that, you bleach those ones off, and then you start all over again with a new set of antibodies. And you can do somewhere in eight to 20 cycles of this. And so you get registry, you get a whole bunch of images, each one telling you about the location of specific proteins in, in the, uh, the image that you're working on. And there's, you know, there's a fair amount of degradation in this, so you lose stuff. Uh, there isn't complete exact alignment between these things, so you have what's called registration and stitching. And then you can come out of that with a, an image that, you know, sort of looks like this. So now I've gone back to the same x y position from the slide over here, but I things now have a vector of let's say twenty uh, at, at each pixel that tells me you know what antibodies were were there when when I sort of ran this this assay, and so now 
if I keep that spatial information for my single cell, so I basically dissociate things in a way and tag them so that I know essentially where they came from on the cell, we can start to tie back together what expression I'm seeing and where it is. And we can understand whether the expression of genes and cells on the edge, outer edge of this one here are different than on the inner edge. If we can detect immune cells in here, we can understand what those immune cells happen to be doing. Right? And then we can sort of run this all through our standard uh, uh, tools for um, uh, uh, finding clusters in this thing. We can partition on, you know, pull out the T cells and look at other things, et, et cetera. So that, that's sort of, you know, a, a pretty nice technology. And this isn't the only one. There are other technologies uh, that are, are uh, labeling ones, merfish and, and other fish-based ones that let me look at single RNA transcripts, et cetera. Then down here, what I'm showing is in the, in the right part here, it, it, this is a Manhattan plot. It tells me about genetic association for a disease. If that's the same disease, for example, that we had up here in our slide, then we'd like to bring that in. And then, you know, here's a slide from NCBI where they've carefully curated a whole bunch of information. We're gonna bring all of this stuff together and we want to use that to sort of get an idea, right? Um, and the challenge here is that the bulk of what I want to integrate to get that idea is not going to be stuff that the NCBI has put together. It's going to be these experimental data sets. And if they're well analyzed, et cetera, then they're really going to help me do that. I can imagine that maybe this is a, a slice from somebody with pancreatic cancer. I want to know about um, you know, islet cells in the pancreas. I've got a GWAS on pancreatic cancer. I picked out particular genes that I think might be interesting, right? And so how do we put those together and make it pretty easy uh, from a, you know, your, your laptop to access that? And that's, you know, one of the challenges. The challenges get a lot bigger than that because there's no one of these little things that I've shown you here that is the only one of those in the world. For every one of these, there are thousands of slides, if not tens of thousands. There are tens of thousands of cells. There are tens of thousands of proteins. We want to do different things with them. There are tens of thousands of GWASs, right? All of this stuff. Batch effects will come in and, and have big uh, uh, um, effects. You may, you know, one of the questions that often comes up of, you know, how, how important is it to use sort of uniform pipelines? Well, the problem with not using uniform pipelines is that when you find things that are different, you don't necessarily know whether those differences are due to how you process the, the samples or whether they're biological. And it's really important to know that, right? Processing will introduce a whole bunch of artifacts and we spend a lot of our time in, in computational biology, trying to remove artifacts like batch effects and other things, and also building tools so that when we encounter something, we can ask the question of, is it a batch effect? Is it real? And we try to rely on multiple set, sets of inputs to, to help guide us. And so this is sort of a lot of why I think we need these large sort of multi sort of modal databases that are gonna need to be integrated the data that goes into them can't just be dumped in there uh, sort of willy-nilly. I think it really has to have some careful curation and uh, um, uh, validation. And so we need to it, sort of improve uh, what I would call our provenance. Many of you, especially the ones who have written and maintained packages, they're already introduced to some of that important provenance. It's the, the fact that your package is in a, in a you know, sort of a GitHub repository means that you have complete control over it. You can check out things and check in things. You have learned how to develop testing paradigms for your software. You've learned how to use version numbers and you're able to convey to your users, you know, this version has these improvements. These are all essential things um, for these compli complex systems that I'm talking about because if I want to update this system, and I guarantee you I'd like to update it with new software every year, I need to have a sense that the person delivering that software has been careful that the new version of their software will work better than the old one. And when they've added improvements, I can understand what they are and take advantage of them. If, if that's not true, then I end up in a situation where I've built the database once, but I'll never be able to improve it. And similar approaches are going to need, be needed for bringing the data in, 
we need provenance, we need good Q QA and QC, and as we discover things that are incorrect, we'll go back and improve things. Um, oops. Uh, for me, at least, uh, you know, I have a pretty limited uh, uh, experience to date with single cell, but I don't think there's any single cell data set that I've been able to download where the rows and the columns have been annotated in a way that's entirely concordant with what was described in the paper that, that sort of talked about that. Often some of the important uh, features that they use to either sort cells or identify cell types are left out of the, the information that's put into the, you know, sort of um, uh, um, uh, databases uh, that, that I can download data from. There's often very complex metadata that describes how the experiment was carried out, what the limitations are, what you know, sort of assays were performed or pertur perturbations. And then very often, even when people produce a nice data set, there isn't much documentation on how one might use it um, and how one might start to interact with, with some of that data and put it together, right? So we, we already have this idea in Bioconductor of putting things together. We use vignettes that allow us to bring in different things to, to sort of get to a better result. And we need uh, to, to think of those uh, even more as we go forward is how do I take all of this stuff, put it in a, together in a way that allows somebody else to understand what I did and then use it for discovery. Okay. Different data technologies are going to be very uh, key in this uh, uh, operation. We're going to need people who are comfortable moving between SQL and NoSQL type databases, who make use of HDF5 and TileDB, the new uh, technology in, in R that's, that's come out in the last year, the sort of alt-rep um, uh, uh, sort of paradigm will let us, as it gets bit more widely adopted and the implementations become more concrete, it will allow us to sort of, you know, in some sense, have all of the benefits of these external databases without ever having to understand them and, and how they work. But right now, we often have to really know how to get there. And then we'll need workflow languages. And again, these aren't endorsements of any of these. They're really examples. Um, they're ones that I know people are using. And, and, and uh, you know, certainly HDF5 we were using back e even at the probably first year of the bioconductor project, although then we were thinking that you'd store, um, you know, microarray data in there because at that time, you know, a 30,000 gene by 10, by, by 100 sample data set was really kind of big for R. And nowadays we use much bigger data sets and they're fast and you can do it on a laptop. So things have gotten much better, but then the ability to make big data sets has, has gotten, you know, better faster. Um, we have a reliance on algorithms, and this really implies that there's um, that you have to have large, well curated data sets on which these algorithms have been trained and tested. If you don't have that, it's hard to improve the algorithms, and it's hard to understand what the algorithms are doing. Um, and so, again, we we do need to to build better uh, data sets for machine learning, etc., for that field for us to move that field forward. Uh, again, you know, not calling people out because it's, it's hard, but if you look at a lot of the machine learning uh, uh, papers that are, are being published, many of them are basically based essentially on the data set that the, the, the paper is talking about and really haven't had access to a large database of, of training data outside of that. And this is, again, I think is a place where Bioconductor and the Bioconductor community can, can help and start to do things. We need data sets that are very comprehensive, especially if we want to do things, you know, as I said, moving into the clinic, we can't have, you know, only uh, one type of patient or miss a whole sort of uh, uh, race or ethnicity, et cetera. We really do have to worry about coverage um, and we should worry about coverage for a whole bunch of other reasons. And I'll talk about that. Um, data sets are going to get updated and improved. We may have a really nice single cell prostate cancer data set today, but a year from now, maybe there's a way better one. How do we move that into this ecosystem that we're talking about building and know that by putting that in, everything is still going to work, right? This is, is a much more complicated situation um, and that it will take time for us to come up with processes. As I said before, we'd like data. If it's single cell, should it be through exactly the same pipeline? How much 
sort of difference can you accept and what do you, what will those differences entail? Um, if, you know, different pipelines get you different things. And so we, re we will really have to think hard about how to do those things. And then if, if we do go into clinical practice, uh, you know, as I said, which is the example I'm talking about, then any clinician that's actually going to use a system like this will have to have essentially real-time access to the appropriate data resources so that when a person comes in, you're able to take the, their information, run it through whatever algorithms you have, and come out with some amount of, of recommendation for what next steps might be taken. One of the key roles in understanding phenotypes, and in, for me, you know, one of the important phenotypes is disease. Uh, you know, wh what's different between somebody without a disease and with a disease is really the ability to perturb the system and see what happens, right? If I think gene X is associated with risk for a fatty liver disease, then, you know, I'd like to be able to look at this in systems where it's perturbed and see whether from that perturbation I can understand what the functional role of the perturbed gene might have been. So, for example, you might have a, a, a hepatocyte where when you mutate a gene, you see that the lipid droplets change in shape or quantity, right? That would be a, a hint of why this gene might be important in understanding fatty liver disease because perturbing it changes the sort of lipid balance or lipid droplets in the cell. There are lots of these perturbations around. We can do more of them. They're not always as well instrumented as they could be, um, but, but they are amazingly productive. CRISPR screens, attack seek, site seek. There are many organoid systems, so you can put neurons in sort of brain-like things. You can build a, a hip joint on a chip. You can put sort of lung epithelia on a chip and then do that in, in either different genetic backgrounds or in cells that have been altered in different ways and start to see, well, you know, here's, here's what's different between this one and that one. And this is where we'll start a little bit on, of talking about genetics. Genetics is really nature's way of perturbing the system, um, but there are some important differences. So genetics isn't like a CRISPR screen, right? Um, one of the big differences is, you know, if you have a mutated gene, it's there at conception, it's passed down to essentially every daughter cell. And so that same exact mutation is present in absolutely every cell of the organ, organism. If they, it, that, that gene might have a big impact on development. And so the, the, the mutation might be what's called embryonically lethal so that the, the, the sort of single cell will not grow up to be a, an adult of whatever species it is. But that doesn't tell me anything about what might happen in adults. In adults, I might be able to perturb that gene as much as I want. Its role might be essential in getting from one cell to a trillion cells, but it might be not that relevant in you know, keeping the adult healthy. And so we, we have, you know, we, we only get to see, in, in, in a sense, sort of grown up humans. And so we know that, that they didn't have a sort of an essential pro essentiality problem. Nature also is a little bit lazy. She does not do every possible combination. She doesn't, you know, mutate every gene in the genome. You sort of only get what you get, um, and and that's great. So some evidence is is of, of a effect is good, but you know, absence of an effect if you didn't have a perturbation is often not that informative. It can be informative, um, you know, if you can show that that uh, you know there's there's sort of some sort of selection acting on it, but that's usually hard. And then you have lots of confounding, um, in part because we often see in a, in a human multiple perturbations at one time. And so you're trying, going to try to say, well, this phenotype is due to this one, but there were many others that were present. And so this, this becomes a problem. And then humans are diploid. And this comes back to a lot of the screens. You know, doing a CRISPR screen on a set of cells doesn't mean that you'll necessarily knock out both copies of any given gene in exactly the same way. Um, it's re really quite complicated to do that. And from genetics, the same is true. Common variants, I might see people that are homozygous. So both copies wild type, both copies mutated, and one of each. That's good when I see it. Then I have a sort of dose response type curve that I can look at. Um, uh, importance of diversity. So we need diversity all over the place. This is one of my, my favorite examples from, from pharma. Um, you, it turns out that for reasons I don't, well, I guess I understand a little bit, um, in, in mouse models uh, are uh, 
very similar genetically, um, but they don't necessarily have a lot of sex diversity. It turns out in neurobiology, males are preferred and almost all of the experiments are male only. And in oncology, um, it's to, females are often preferred because you can put more mice into a cage. Males, you typically can only put one mouse in a cage, otherwise they'll, they'll fight and you're not that's ethically uh, you know, not appropriate. But even when they needed to use things, even when you're looking at a cancer type, which is different between males and females, we don't always stick the, the you know, do the, the trial in the, in the sort of sex that you would think that they would do. And, and often it's not recorded what sex was used or any justification given. So this is just a, a couple of examples of, of that. Okay, so. And then, of course, there's the, the great thing of genotype plus environment equals phenotype. So you're not, your life is not determined by your genotype, except in very, very rare cases where you have strong sort of genetic effects. And wellness or any specific disease is a phenotype. You can think of a response of a C T cell in your body to a chemokine or a cytokine, that's a phenotype. How does it respond when it sees some chemical morphology of a cancer cell? What does it look like? or how does it respond to a therapeutic? These are all phenotypes and we'd like to study them and how we study them is through this sort of equation of genotype plus environment. Um, so our models need access to good genetic information, good data on the environment if we're gonna treat patients, uh, exposures, behaviors. Um, genotyping is sort of the easiest problem to solve. If you have tissue, we're pretty good at it. We can get genotypes reasonably well. Uh, cancer is a little bit different um, because the tumor ha can uh, have quite a bit of variation in it and it's hard often to capture a, a sense of that variation. Getting good environment data at scale is harder. We don't do it very well. It hardly ever resides in a single location. There's a EMR, electrical, uh, electronic medical record, self-report. Uh, data is uh, what we did at 23andMe. And you really need that, in my view, to be able to do stuff at the scale we want to do uh, things at. Uh, you, you know, if you want 100 million people and you want phenotype on them, it's probably going to be self-reported, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. And then other uh, measurements, like you know, lots of people are happy walking around with an Apple Watch on uh, or a Fitbit, and they contribute that data either back to, you know, it all goes back to Apple or to to, to Fitbit's uh, parent company, and you can, you know, they can use that data to do different things. Uh, 23andMe, we had people volunteering to give us that kind of data, so you, you can get a lot of, of nice data. And then as we move forward, these improvements in machine learning, which I won't get into very much here, are just going to help us build better and more interpretable and actionable models. Okay, um, so I'm about halfway through. Um, I, I will spend a bit of time on genetics. I'm probably not going to get into to uh, skip over a few things to, to cover most of the, the highlights. Okay, so genetics basically in my view is just plays an increasingly important role in biology in biological discovery. Um, I, you know, we, we have started with these high throughput screens. Um, typically the way that they're run is on a heavily instrumented cell line. Um, so CRISPR screens might be done in, you know, like a, a HeLa cell or a, a, a HEC cell or, or whatever. Unfortunately, that doesn't really have any genetic diversity that's appropriate for us understanding, you know, what would happen in, in the human population. And so what I think we'll see over the next, uh, you know, handful of years, and, and we're seeing a little bit of it, is we, we want to do CRISPR screens not in a single heavily instrumented cell line, but across a whole bunch of cells from different donors who have different genotypes. And depending on what we're looking at, we'd like to we would like to choose those donors who've given us cells to work on to have genetic backgrounds that are, you know, contain risk variants for the disease or the condition we're trying to, set, to, to study. So the more we can get that genetic diversity into our high throughput screens, the more we're going to be able to understand what those alleles in the, the genome, those variants, are actually doing. And th this, when it comes, I think will also be uh, allow us to do a pretty big step forward in understanding, you know, systems biology and, and, and how that functional data will relate to, to disease risk and to 
you know, what are the cellular mechanisms that give rise to an increased risk for asthma or an increased risk for pancreatic cancer. I don't think that it will be very long uh, before almost all uh, people that go to the hospital will be genotyped. The, the cost of genotyping is down pretty low now. It's around $100. It can be done reasonably rapidly. And um, the, the, you know, as soon as the, 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 the equation changes a little bit and the hospital can save more than $100 on your treatment by knowing your genotype, this is going to just sort of sweep through, right, because it's cost effective. Whether that ultimately gets stored in your medical record or becomes something you sort of carry around on your, your laptop or your iPhone or whatever uh, device you use is, you know, sort of to be determined. But once it's cheaper for uh, institutions to give medical care knowing genotype than it is not, than it is to give medic medical care not knowing genotype, there's going to be a, a huge amount of pressure and, and it will benefit all of us. Uh, I'm not a big fan of whole genome sequencing, except in specific situations. I'm happy to discuss that with folks, but, but largely genotyping is pretty effective. It's about a hundred bucks to do that. And then you can impute that off of a imputation panel, which is based on whole genome sequences, but you can get to 40 million variants today. And uh, you know, within a few years, we'll be to 80 million or hundred million imputed variants. So it's, a, it's pretty accurate. Uh, and, and pretty effective. So it'll be hard to beat that. Cost of, uh, of sequencing is more like $1,500 still, depending on what you do. Um, and so a 15X delta is going to take a long time to, to overcome. Right, so human genome, uh, probably not worth going into. Three and a half billion nucleotides in a single copy, so there's a lot of stuff there, um, but you know, the important stuff, the high frequency stuff is not uh, in, anywhere near that scale. 40 million, 100 million variants will keep us busy for quite a while. Um, for folks that don't know genetics, we'll go into it a little bit because uh, it's kind of interesting and, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll see that it's kind of important. So our, our genome is on 22 autosomes. For the autosomes, each of us has a pair, you get one from mom and one from dad. And then the sex chromosomes, uh, uh, X and Y, women have two Xs and men have an X and Y. That gives us uh, 23 pairs of uh, uh, chromosomes, which is the reason for the name of 23andMe, of course. Um, and then, uh, we see variation in the genome that's associated with human disease. So all a GWAS trial is, or GWAS analysis is, is we look down that whole genome, all three and a half billion positions, and at each one say, does the variation in the nucleotide sequence at this location across all of these people associate with risk for disease? So it's really just a whole bunch of, you know, the simplest form chi-squared statistics, but since we adjust for covariates, it's just a ton of logistic regressions that go on just walking down the, the chromosome. And that's really good in some ways, and it's problematic in others. And one of the things that's really important for genetic diversity um, is, is crossing over. And it's worth understanding this if you're going to work uh, very much in, in sort of human uh, genetics or, and genomics. So this primarily occurs during uh, meiosis, which is the creation of gametes. So, uh, when a, an egg or a sperm is created. And there are usually two to three events per chromosome per meiosis. And what this means functionally is I got one chromosome from my mom for chromosome one, and I got one from my dad. But the chromosome one I got from my dad didn't look like any of the chromosome one in his body. It had a mixture of the two copies that he got from his parents, and the same from my mom. The chromosome I get from her, very seldom, in very rare cases, they pass down a, an, an intact one, but almost always, you'll get a chromosome one from your mom, and it won't be the same as the chromosome one that she has in every cell in her body. It will be a mix of the two copies that she has. So take some parts from one and some parts. But because there's only two or three of these, it's not like it's you know mixing at the nucleotide level. You sort of get things that are like, here's a stretch of one parent. This dark blue is a stretch of another, stretch of that one, and then the light blue back to the first parent. So you get pretty big chunks. And because of this, 
we have something called linkage disequilibrium. When you get a variant that from your parent, you, you will get a whole bunch of things that are near it as well. And so the, the genotypes at a particular location are very similar. If you found that same nucleotide in your parents' genome, they'd be identical to that. And then if you went to the grandparents and found that same sort of tag nucleotide, everything around that would be the same. And as you go back, um, and the, the shorter that span that you're looking at, the less likely it is that it's had an interruption in however many generations back you're going. And so you sort of pass small pieces along. Longer pieces tend to get broken up. And over thousands and tens of thousands of years, these pieces can get broken up to be quite small. So what does that say? So linkage disequilibrium, that's the strong association between nearby variants, causes confounding. So I can't always, in a, a GWAS study, say this variant is the right one because there are other ones near it that also uh, have very similar frequency. They're on the same haplotype, et cetera. Um, the good side of that is this process of imputation that I talked about of taking a, a, a genotype array, so I only measured it at a few hundred thousand places, and then trying to fill in the gaps. Well, that works really well because of LD, so it sort of you know, balances out a little bit. We can do imputation really well, but we do end up with confounding in the statistical sense. We also have the problem that we just don't have a perfect reference, right? There is no good human reference currently. They're getting a lot better over time. We've, we've now I think uh, a project has uh, started to sequence entire chromosomes end to end. That will be fantastic. But even when they do, the right reference for Europeans will not be the right reference for East Asians or South Asians or Africans. And then one of the things we forget a lot when we do genetics and genomics is that we're diploid as humans and we really have two copies of each chromosome and we need to know often like the phasing. So which nucleotides are together on which one of those two, um, uh, on which of the two chromosomes. Where does it get used in medicine? So we use it for all sorts of things, for drug efficacy, severe adverse events. We know of variants in the genome that if somebody has that variant and they take a drug, they will be hospitalized or, or killed. We'll look at a couple of those. They are at high risk for things. We test for rare variants that are highly pathogenic and highly penetrant. So the BRCA genes for breast cancer, FH for familial hypo cholesteremia, G6PD deficiency, Huntington's disease, these sorts of things. In practice, this is done uh, 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 on a per gene basis by sequencing around that gene. That turns out to be expensive. The, the sort of equations for putting this out into the public are often like, how, what's the benefit versus the, the cost of doing the the assay, and it's hard for those to be cost effective, but what 23andMe and, and others are trying to do is say, well, but if we do the whole genome at once, then the cost effective piece sort of goes away. You don't have to pay one price for BRCA1 and then another price for FH. If we do this really well, you'll get BRCA1, FH, and everything else all in one uh, single single go, and that will, will help drive the cost down. And then, as I said, just because other things are going to make it cheaper and better to do this in hospitals, then this will start to come along and change uh, uh, how that's done. Drug efficacy, uh, there's a CYP2C19 allele. It's uh, associated with reduced active clopidogrel metabolites and results in a higher on-treatment plate aggregation. So basically people who um, have this thing, uh, have adverse clinical outcomes in certain cardiovascular diseases, um, one of, one of the, again, sort of great things, 23andMe just got approved for a direct-to-consumer report on this. Um, so you can now just uh, go, go get that done for yourself. Uh, for folks that don't know, you typically can't go get genetics of this nature done in the United States for yourself. You typically need prescriptions. Um, G6PD deficiency, this is X-linked. It's recessive, and males are at substantially increased risk. Uh, G6PD produces an enzyme that protects red blood cells, and those with the deficiency are at risk for signs and symptoms of hemolytic anemia. They can have pretty bad uh, drug reactions, and they ha can have life-threatening reactions to fava beans. Um, and 
part of the reason I have this here is just to, to draw your attention down here to the, to the bottom right, where we can see that the allele frequency for this variant that causes this deficiency, V68M, is only about 0.03% in Europeans, so almost impossible to find there. But if we look at African-Americans, and similar results would be true for Africans, it's a 15% allele. So for Africans, this is a pretty serious um, uh, concern. And if you're homozygote for this, you're going to, to be in trouble. And because it's X-linked, you only need one copy because um, uh, you, you only have one X. Um, there's uh, about 400 million people worldwide with this deficiency that would benefit from knowing about it. And even in the European thing, you know, that's a pretty small allele frequency, 0.03%, but there's still around 45,000 Europeans in the US who don't know that they have this problem. And then slightly different examples. So that first variant is great if you're African-American. If you go back, it's not so great if you're pretty much anything else, uh, if 1% in Hispanic, so that's uh, you know, of some use. Here we find another allele, S188F, where we now see people of Middle Eastern descent have a 4% of, of risk for that. So trying to highlight how important it is to look at these things across a different uh, whole set of, of of uh, ethnicities, and then the same here to some more examples, mixed diagnoses, you know, multiple patients, all of whom were African or unspecified ancestry got positive reports for variants misclassified as pathogenic um, at the time of testing. Subsequently, all these variants were re-characterized as benign, um, and the mutations that were most common in this uh, uh, general population were significantly more common in black Americans. So we, we looked at these genes, these variants in Europeans, saw an association with disease. This is where the sort of linkage disequilibrium got us in trouble. It wasn't the thing that we thought it was, it was something nearby. And then with black uh, uh, Americans, they, they came in, they were genotyped, they had that risk allele and treatment was engaged in even though, in fact, they had no risk of the disease, there was another allele nearby that was the one that you needed to look at. Um, and so these sorts of, of errors in, in, in treatment are quite substantial and ones that we need to sort of help remove. And, and then, you know, there's sort of nothing special. This would be true and is true for people of Asian descent, for uh, different uh, ethnicities in India, et cetera. You know, it's, it is important when we look at therapeutics to really understand the genetic uh, diversity in, in different populations and make sure we're, we're diagnosing people correctly. And let me spend the last few minutes here, I got about five or six. Uh, one of the things that's come out in the last few years, and I don't know if people here are aware of, of this, but it's a, it's a pretty nice technology. They're called polygenic risk scores. And the idea is that essentially we're, we will take a disease, we will fit a GWAS to it. We will find all the loci in the human genome that associate with risk for that disease. And then uh, out of that, we're gonna build a risk score that sums up over thousands, tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of loci. So we're not gonna uh, sort of determine risk on the basis of just a handful of places. We're gonna determine risk on a lot of places. So again, thinking of the software architecture here, just to sort of bring you back to, to why I'm thinking about this, right? We need good ways of doing the GWAS. We need to get the data out. We need to have good ways of understanding how to put these together to get an estimate of risk. And then we need to go and, and try to do some work in the clinic to show that that estimate of risk is actually appropriate for a clinician to change how they do things. So here is a, a, what's called a Manhattan plot for people that don't know. Each uh, dot here, and there are many of them, there's probably five or six million dots, uh, you can't see them all, uh, represents minus 10, uh, minus log base 10 of the p-value for the association between that variant and the disease. And so anything that comes up above uh, this red line here is deemed to be genome-wide significant. Um, and those are all labeled in green, and those show me the individual variants that are associated with the risk for this particular disease. And so to compute PRS, you just use those summary, summary statistics here. You sum up the odds ratio. So you take a person and say, for this allele here, you know, 
do you have the, the variant that makes higher risk or do you have the variant that makes lower risk? And then we just sum up their total risk. Um, and then there's a little bit of, of machine learning that goes into that. You can use elastic nets and other things to sort of develop this. There's a pretty active community out doing this in human genetics. Uh, ASHG is coming up for people that uh, don't know about it. There'll be tons of, of talks on this. And essentially then what you get out of this is one score per person that estimates their genetic risk. Uh, in this paper by Seth Cathirson and, and colleagues, uh, the idea is, so out of this thing, I'm going to get this sort of normal looking distribution of risk scores. So this is sort of representing across a big cohort of people, all of these different risk scores. And the question is, if I go out here in the tails, do I see enough of an increase in prevalence of the disease for me to be excited about it and think, okay, this is pretty good. Uh, this uh, picture over here on the upper right is probably the easiest one to, to, to get through. So what you do is you take all of your uh, individuals, and if, if you have 100,000 or whatever, and then in, into, uh, this looks like 1% bins. So one, the 1% the 1 of people that had the highest risk score, and here you're asking what's the prevalence of CAD in, in those individuals. And you can see that it's way up here very, very high. And as we go down in risk score, we see that the prevalence of cardiovascular disease is decreasing as well. And this is the sort of thing that convinces us that this is probably a pretty useful thing. So people out here, right, they have 12% uh, risk or 12% prevalence of cardiovascular disease, whereas people with this risk score here have about a 2%. So that's a pretty big change. And if somebody presented in the clinic, with symptoms that were suggestive of cardiovascular, of cardiovascular disease, we might want to treat them differently if this was their risk score than if that was their risk score. And a lot of the work that, that needs to be done now is really just to sort of say, okay, well, how do we do that whole machine learning thing to get there? And then how do we take those things, do clinical type studies to make sure that we can get them into uh, a clinical setting and then find out that they're, they're useful uh, for clinical decision making. Let me skip over this one, skip over this one. This one I want to spend like two minutes on just to sort of give you a sense of how complicated it is and then I'll, I'll wind up. The typical workflow in these things is very, very complex. You start with identifying a problem, you start to try to, what's the right training and testing data set, what's our AI ML approach going to be, we need semant semantic segmentation, classification, multi-instant learning, we go through an iterative learning and performance optimization, we fit our model, get our algorithmic outputs, then we are going to go back here to clinical validation, visualize the models, and then if we get all that done really well, we're going to try to get this through an FDA type approval. And the color coding here, just to give you a sense, is the boxes in green, uh, when you do this, are weeks to months. And the boxes in red, these two here, are typically in practice months to years, um, just to, to give a bit of a, a sense of how hard it is. So really, one of the big places where I think we can do a lot better is getting up well annotated data sets that will allow people to do machine learning faster and, and take some of this part out this clinical validation part, I think, will be much harder. And the only ways that I can see that we'll get that shorter is to come up with, you know, better models for what it means to, to be successful and try to find ways to, you know, um, m m shorten the time by uh, either, either applying it in situations where we'll get a readout faster or finding new readouts that are highly predictive of success that might read out at a, a shorter time period. All right. And then maybe just stop. You do need a very highly multiple disciplinary team. You need clinical folks, pathologists, science, computer scientists, etc. As people know. Um, and I shall stop there. Um, I'm going to exit full screen and I see a few people and take questions. Yes, we, we have collected a few questions. So uh, the first one is a 
about the oh. Uh, one have Jia Wei Huang have a question about twenty three and me. Can you explain how this will work with diseases? From my understanding, some drug molecular will take effect effect by binding to some target protein. I don't don't understand this question. <laughs> um, is it just in the chat? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, I have to stop sharing to see the chat, so I'm going to do that, but I'll come back if I need to. Um, um, expect the hospital, the so uh, I see, I'm not at the top. All right. Okay. Well, and when can we expect the hospital to offer the general genotyping assays to patients or newborn babies? That, as I said, it, it's really going to be, uh, you know, I, I would expect less than a decade, but it's very, uh, very hard to know um, what will happen. Uh, newborns, I think that's a great idea. That's one of the things that personally I'd like to be able to try to get off the ground. Um, you know, the reason why that's interesting, particularly interesting, is because they're right at the start of life and there are lots of things that genetics can tell you about them um, that can be quite useful to, to parents. Um, things like susceptibility to uh, sunburns, uh, how, how they react to mosquito bites, how they react to poison oak and poison ivy, susceptibility to ear infections, these all are traits, human phenotypes, that have a strong genetic component. Um, and as a, a parent of two children, most of those things, I would have loved to know that there were genetic issues long before I ended up having to deal with the, the actual uh, you know, issue myself. And so I think that's a, a place where it'll be very interesting. It will help, I think, understand how, how to deliver care from the very earliest part in somebody's life. And I think, you know, if done well, it will be a, a fascinating experiment. Um, next one, high throughput genetic data continues to evolve from gene tip to RNA-seq to single cell. And what other data do you think will become a research hotspot? Well, I, I mean, I think the spatial stuff now is really pretty cool. The mixing, the multimodality, can we get proteomics uh, and uh, uh, RNA at the same time? Can we figure out where uh, in, in, in those images, right, starting to understand, like, what does a T cell look like in a tumor microenvironment? And, you know, are there genetic backgrounds where when we look at people with one genetic background, their T cells are the ones that get exhausted or don't react to the tumor in the way we'd like them to, um, and then start to understand, well, what, what actually went wrong and to start to think about what the therapeutic would look like. So I think this is fantastic. Um, how do you acknowledge uh, contributors of software and data sets and how to get better funds for these works? Yeah, that's again a great question, folks. These are, these are really good ones. Um, so I think software we've gotten there. Um, I think that people that develop software now who write packages and those packages get used. We're seeing more and more people, uh, you know, citing them accurately, as Martin said, there's, uh, 40,000 uh, articles or so at, at PubMed that cite Bioconductor. That's a big step up. And when you can uh, show that you're a contributor to that, you get to claim some of that uh, credit, right? It's, 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 uh, it's credit for the project. And so I think you can get there. Data sets, I think, are, are harder to attribute, and we, we need to find ways to do that. Um, and, and to, to make sure that they're public so that everybody, no matter who they are, can make use of them. Uh, one of the, the things that I'm very opposed to are these uh, unfortunate licenses that people put on uh, either software or data that preclude commercial companies from using them. I think that's really a, a, a not a, a great uh, decision and it, it moves people away from using your, your tools and your data. Um, it's very unlikely that you will you know, be able to get rich off of a single data set, but you will be able to slow science down pretty substantially. Um, and then funding, I think it's just going to be demonstrating this, um, you know, my, my return to Harvard really came because a, a 
you know, the, the dean and, and, and uh, uh, some very generous donors at Harvard ha have seen that this is an important role to play um, if they want to change the, the sort of some of the way that medicine is practiced and, and, and um, uh, research is done. Um, let's see, next question here. Hi, I'm new to this area and simple question about 23andMe. Can you explain how this will work with diseases from my understanding some drug molecules? Uh, yeah, so I too don't understand that. Uh, Wei, <laughs> if you could clarify. Um, I don't know if, if, uh, if Jin can take you off of mute. Uh, if you want to just raise your hand or something and maybe, maybe you can explain a little bit more. Yes. Maybe you can just check the last question. I'll go, yeah. what, I'll go to the next one. Yeah, the last one. What can Bioconduct Project do on the data security and the pa patient privacy? That's a great question. Um, you know, in, in essence, right now, we don't, in, within the Bioconductor Project, we don't really work at that level. But what you'll see coming through, and certainly in the United States, and I think in Europe as well, there are growing uh, a sort of, uh, of um, technological uh, solutions to saying, um, here's some data, it's genotype data. I have it locked down, it's encrypted, but it has an API and you can ask it specific questions, um, but you won't ever get to see the individual level data, right? This is starting to happen in Europe where, uh, you know, different countries in, in Europe, they be, each many countries are too small to have a huge sort of genetic component or bioinformatic component. So there's a big project there called Elixir that is trying to help, uh, you know, sort of develop tools and strategies for sharing data across boundaries. And they've really started to go down uh, this road pretty well. Um, summary statistics are often all that you need. Um, and then, um, you know, but, but largely security and patient privacy are going to be handled by security and, and privacy on the computer you're working on okay. within, as I said, the United States, there are these uh, increasing levels of security that, uh, that the NIH has put together. Um, I, I can't remember all of them, FISMA, and then, you know, there, 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 there's a set of stages where each, each level as you go up, you can have uh, government, uh, you know, sort of medical data on in your databases, but then access is very heavily controlled. So that's not really Bioconductor that'll do that. It's really going to be around access control. And okay, um, okay. Uh, due, due to the limited time, the question should be ended now. So thanks, Robert, again. So R is a fantastic platform to come to use. I, I think it is. Give, give us a great help. Yeah. Thank you very much.